This is Phil Cutman with a tutorial on security plans. Security is no longer optional in embedded systems. Warning signs that you need to pay more attention to security include the following. First, and perhaps most obviously, if you do not have a written security plan, that's a problem. Another warning sign is that your product design assumes that you will have perfect security because there really is no such thing as perfect security. Finally, a warning sign is when designers make unrealistic security assumptions, such as assuming that a device with an ethernet port will never ever be connected to the internet. That's just not realistic in most cases. In this tutorial, I'll discuss the why, what, and how involved in planning for security. Topics that should be in the plan include why is security important to your system? This includes which aspects of security matter the most to you and which aspects are really important for your particular application. Also, what types of attacks do you expect? This includes the mechanics of the attack as well as what type of attackers you expect to actually be interested in your system. Finally, how can you mitigate the risk? And if you do attempt to mitigate the risk, how do you know that you're actually succeeding at doing so? A good security plan contains the following elements. A discussion of security requirements. An analysis of expected threats. An analysis of likely system vulnerabilities. Plans to mitigate security threats and vulnerabilities. And finally, a plan to validate that mitigation has been successful, which has to include lifecycle monitoring of emergent threats and vulnerabilities. Let's discuss the elements of a good security plan, starting with security requirements. Security requirements answer the question of why you want your system to be secure and what it means to be secure. A generic description of security is protecting against unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification, or destruction. However, you probably care much more about some aspects of security than others. Generally, security is characterized according to the so-called CIA properties, which stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality has to do with ensuring information is released only when it is supposed to be. The most well-known aspect of confidentiality is secrecy. Secrecy means that only authorized parties can see particular information. Secrecy is usually implemented using encryption. As an example, an encrypted thermostat command might obscure what temperature setting you sent to your house via your smartphone. In some systems, an observer might know that you sent a thermostat command, but cannot tell what temperature you selected. In other systems, an observer would know that you sent a message, but not even know that this message is a thermostat command. Either way, you're getting some measure of secrecy. Another aspect of confidentiality is called privacy. Privacy ensures that activities cannot be associated with an individual or other entity. To continue the thermostat example, privacy might make the temperature you send to your house publicly available for statistical use, but make it impossible for anyone else to know whose house that temperature was sent to. The I in CIA is integrity, which has to do with making sure that only appropriate changes are made to a system. Preventing or detecting unauthorized data alteration or destruction is called preserving data integrity. For a thermostat example, it is usually important to ensure that new firmware downloads have not been tampered with to avoid introducing malicious code. On the other hand, ensuring that changes to system state can only be made by authorized entities is called authentication. A related concept is non-repudiation, which means that once someone has made an authorized change, it is possible to prove that they made the change and it was not an imposter. For a thermostat, this probably means you do not want strangers changing your thermostat setting, and non-repudiation is probably not that big an issue. The A in CIA stands for availability, which has to do with whether the system is actually working. The most common concept regarding availability is that denial of service attacks are designed to take a system down, thus reducing availability. For a thermostat, this might mean that you do not want malicious attackers to be able to drain your thermostat's battery 
by spamming it with radio messages from some other compromised device in your house. There are many other concepts related to security beyond these, but this set provides a broad overview of the types of issues security deals with. Which of these CIA properties matters to you depends on your system. Often in embedded systems, data integrity matters more than security. For example, while privacy is nice, you might care much more about someone changing your thermostat setting to freeze your pipes in the winter than you do about whether your utility company knows your exact thermostat setting information. The next element of the security plan has to deal with threats, which means thinking about what types of attacks your system will undergo once it is deployed. This graphic shows the types of embedded systems used in various industrial control applications and gives some examples about different types of attacks and how they might affect particular applications. It's important to note that most of these types of attacks will apply to any application, so these are just illustrations of more general principles. On the left side of the diagram, there's a port automation application, and an attack on that might be a so-called ransomware attack. Ransomware has been increasingly seen on desktop computers, but can also affect embedded systems, especially if they run a desktop operating system. In this example, a bad guy takes over the controls of a crane and shuts it down, including locking the operator into the crane. This, in turn, hypothetically caused a shutdown of an entire port facility until operator safety could be ensured. Ransomware has been an increasingly difficult problem, including bad guys encrypting hospital records and shutting down businesses. Another example is a malicious insider who modifies operational software in a power generation and transmission facility to cause equipment damage. The last example we'll discuss is an oil exploration rig. In this example, the rig has been infected by malware that alters its control parameters causing damage to the rig. Again, these are just examples and the potential for different variations and combinations of attacks is almost limitless and applies to most embedded systems. When considering threats, there are two aspects to think about. The first is, who is the threat? Usually the most difficult threats come from nation states who have essentially unlimited resources. The next type of malicious actor is often an organized group, which can include both criminal groups and activist groups of various sorts. They present a significant threat, but often do not have quite the unlimited resources of a nation state. Script kiddies are individuals of low ability who gain access to very sophisticated attacks by getting tools that permit them to use those attacks even if they don't really understand the details. This class of attacker is extremely important to consider because a nation state or other organized group might develop a very sophisticated attack and that attack might become available in the form of an automated tool at low or zero cost and then be exploited by myriad script kiddies. This effect is a primary reason why essentially every computer on the internet is enduring continuous attacks of some sort or another. Typically, the most vulnerable time window for an attack is when a vulnerability is publicly announced, but the patch hasn't been released yet. That's because a weaponized tool is likely to be made available quickly to everyone who wants it, and that vulnerability window stays open until the corresponding patch is both released and installed on the system you care about. Another class of threat actor is the casual abuser, who you might think of as a person who walks through a parking lot, trying all the car doors to see who left the car unlocked. Finally, they're insiders who can compromise security either through malicious intent or just plain negligence. An ex-employee in particular can do a lot of damage, especially if they retain a master password of some sort. But even well-intentioned employees who are trying to do the right thing can compromise security by, for example, unknowingly setting weak passwords, accidentally loading malicious software onto a system, or overriding safety mechanisms manually because they're in a hurry and under pressure to get the job done. Beyond the who of an attack is the motivation for the attack. Motivations for an attack include such things as politics and economics, 
surveillance, denial of service, and even extorting a ransom. Various combinations of motivations can apply to various types of attackers. Some attacks are not directly motivated by the desire to harm a particular target, but rather are motivated by the internal needs of the attacker. One such need is fame and notoriety, which applies to attackers who are trying to make a name for themselves. It can even be argued that so-called white hat hackers who find problems and responsibly report them to equipment designers are doing so for these sorts of reasons. Finally, some attackers just do it for the lulls, as they say. In other words, they get a chuckle and think it's fun to break a system. The problem with the last couple types of motivation is that there may not even be a rational way to evaluate whether it's likely to happen to your system. Either it happens or it doesn't, and it may not matter whether you can think of a reason why someone would want to attack you based on your product or business. It might just happen because you get unlucky and someone decides that would be fun to attack you. Overall, for threat analysis, you should be sure to handle the most likely agents of attack and the most likely motivations. But in the end, something can always happen, which is why I earlier said security is never really perfect. Rather, it's a trade-off of risk versus reward. No matter who the attacker is, they need a vulnerability to exploit. Vulnerabilities include both weaknesses in your system and tactics an attacker can use to gain access to your system. While a detailed explanation of all the various weaknesses and tactics is beyond what we can do here, it is worth mentioning some of the main ones so that you know what topics to follow up with when creating a security plan. Resource management is a prevalent security problem in computer systems. Perhaps the most famous resource management problem is a buffer overflow, in which an attacker feeds a large piece of data to a program that is expecting a small piece of data, and this results in memory corruption. Related attacks involve causing the system to run out of memory due to garbage collection bugs, and causing the system to miss deadlines by overloading it or feeding it exceptional input values. Speaking of exceptional input values, Improper input validation is another common security weakness. Systems may crash when presented with exceptional inputs and can even give the attacker access to privileged command modes. A related attack is that inputs might be executed as system commands instead of data, especially when using query languages such as SQL that look for commands inside of their data streams. Improper authentication takes a variety of forms. The system might simply not check that a password has been provided before performing a sensitive operation, or it might be configured to expose sensitive information without a password. A system might also be vulnerable to a delayed message playback in which an attacker stores a legitimate message and plays it back later, for example, unlocking a door with a stored command when the door is supposed to stay locked. Man-in-the-middle attacks involve an adversary intercepting a message, modifying it potentially, and then forwarding it without the receiver knowing that it's received a corrupted message. Usually, when cryptography is compromised, it is because of some sort of bad cryptographic approach, such as using outdated, homegrown, or bad cryptographic algorithms, poorly randomized secret keys, or insecure cryptographic protocols. There are many potential cryptographic weaknesses, and these are just examples. It's important to get this right and to look to experts to help you with cryptographic algorithms and protocols. But what about the attacker's strategy and tactics? Attackers have many different approaches for compromising the system, which sometimes exploit specific weaknesses, but other times are more general. If your system has a so-called backdoor, such as a factory password that's the same on every system, the attacker doesn't need to break cryptographic protection. Rather, they simply need to look on the internet and find out what the factory password is, and they're in. Even if a password isn't on the internet, which it usually is, 
attackers can try a brute force search of common passwords and even short randomly selected passwords. For an example, an attacker might start with 1234 and 777 and see if those get in before trying something more sophisticated. Additionally, attackers can feed a system randomly selected values in a technique called fuzzing just to see if they can somehow break the system and gain access. All of these approaches require very little effort, are easy to automate, and are very often successful. Phishing, spelled with a PH, is when an attacker tricks a victim. That trick might involve clicking on an email link to install malware, visiting a malicious web page, or entering their password into a fake request to revalidate their credentials, and so on. You've probably seen these in your email, and those show up in your email because they tend to work often enough to make it worthwhile for the attackers to try. These are forms of so-called social engineering, which exploit people as the weak link in the security system. To get access to systems which are not connected to a network, attackers can use worms that hop from system to system and even jump between air-gapped computers and network computers via things such as an infected USB flash drive. Attackers also create fake or infected software updates in a so-called Trojan horse attack to permit their malicious software to enter your system disguised as something that would normally be desirable, such as a software update. Finally, to emphasize once again that perfect security is typically unachievable, attackers can reverse engineer your system by, for example, monitoring its power consumption while it's running encryption software and recover secret cryptographic keys that way, just by watching power. They can also deduce proprietary algorithms. And if that turns out to be too difficult to do, they can just rip open the chip and see what's inside. Again, there are many such weaknesses and tactics, but these are some of the more common ones that you should consider when creating your security plan. The next element of a security plan is how you plan to mitigate various vulnerabilities that you have identified. All of this starts with the general idea of having good security via good design. First, consider resource management. Vulnerabilities are common in this area, so it is especially important to pay attention to resource management when designing your system. As mentioned previously, buffer overflows are leading cause of security problems. To understand buffer overflows a little better, here's a picture that illustrates the general idea. This picture shows data on the stack, which in the C programming language is used to hold temporary variables. As an example, consider a procedure that declares a 100 element array with elements numbered 0 through 99. It then uses that array to store input from a user or a network message. If the attacker sends a message with 101 elements, instead of 100 elements, the 101st element will overwrite the return address on the stack with a value of the attacker's choosing. When the subroutine executes its return instruction, it will then execute a jump to wherever the attacker wants to send it. That might be a routine that grants superuser privilege. Or, to be a little more clever, the attacker can modify the values in the array to actually be executable code. Then the attacker can appoint that return address to jump back into the 100 element array and run whatever program the attacker wants to run. Alternately, the attacker can read more elements than have been allocated and retrieve sensitive information from other users, other software, or whatever happens to be laying around a memory, which might include security keys. Stopping these sorts of attacks requires that all inputs stored in arrays or other variable length data structures should be checked for length. A related problem is that software often does not validate input values beyond just string length. All inputs should be checked for proper size and validity. Attackers can easily be successful in compromising systems if they feed them null pointers or not a number of floating point values or null length strings. Always ensure authentication is done properly. There should not be a master password that is the same across multiple systems. 
consider making it difficult for users to use weak passwords, such as the ever-popular 1234. Make sure that the system, as shipped, has strong security with its default configuration and permissions. Avoid shipping systems that have a standard default login password, because a lot of the time, users will not change it, and that will leave the system vulnerable. Make sure to use strong cryptography and proven security protocols. In general, cryptography is one place you should never try to invent something new. Instead, make sure you use well-established, publicly analyzed cryptographic algorithms and security protocols. Along with this, invoke the principle of least privilege, which means never run any software with more permissions than it needs. As a simple example, you should never run application code as root on a Unix system, and you should avoid using administrator accounts on Windows systems for applications, because those just give attackers too much power if they compromise things. Be sure that your system uses a secure bootloader that checks the integrity of its software to ensure a malicious update has not been inserted. This means you also need to authenticate updates using a cryptographic technique such as secure digital signatures. At a high level, the most important security principle is to avoid what is known as security via obscurity. What this means is that a security argument based on the attacker not knowing what you did is a bad security argument. As a concrete example, a proprietary embedded network protocol in which you do not publish the message dictionary is inherently not secure. Even if you think it's obscure, someone will figure it out. History shows us that it's just not that hard. If someone wants to spend the time to do so, even if the motivation is simply bragging rights, they will figure out how to attack your system if you've based your security argument simply on keeping the details a secret. When you ship a system, it should have a unique secret cryptographic key. That cryptographic key has to be different for every single system you ship and cannot be known to anyone, not even a central factory database. Because if you keep it in database, the bad guys will just try and get the database. Your system should be entirely secure, even if an attacker knows absolutely everything there is to know except this one secret key. That means that even if you yourself, the system designer, wanted to attack your system, you cannot succeed unless you have access to the secret key, perhaps via a chip teardown. And even then, all it would help you attack is that one system whose key you retrieved. Any system which does not meet this security standard is, in the end, insecure. Of course, there are many good security design techniques that matter, and this is just an overview of the broad brush strokes of this topic. Once mitigation has been carried out, the question remains as to whether your system is actually secure. Determining that is called validation. There are a number of techniques for validation, and we'll discuss a few. Good security is designed in, not tested in. Good code quality is essential for security. Buggy code is probably insecure because it probably has vulnerabilities that can be exploited and attacked such as buffer overflows and invalid input exceptions. You should use static analysis tools to find unsafe code structures, a stack checker tool to check for buffer overflows and stack overflows, and various other security tools to ensure that weaknesses you attempt to mitigate have really been taken care of. You should perform peer reviews to ensure code quality. To specifically address security, consider using a security-oriented coding standard such as the CERT C98 coding standard, which has concrete rules to avoid weaknesses. For example, one of the rules is that you should never use an unbounded string operation to avoid buffer overflow attacks. Even if you have good code, it still makes sense to do some security testing. Penetration testing typically involves using a list of known exploits to make sure your system is not vulnerable to the attacks that have already been incorporated into script kitty type tools. It may include other types of testing, such as fuzz testing for invalid input exploits and dictionary attacks on passwords. 
The idea of penetration testing is generally to go after the low-hanging fruit of security, which is a great idea. But it does not get you to 100% security alone. You can also do extensive penetration analysis by, for example, hiring or having an internal red team, which consists of expert attackers who see if they can find another security weakness. Again, this is a great idea, but it's always possible for a good attacker to think of something the red team didn't. It's important to design security in, do a reasonable amount of testing, and eventually realize that your system will probably be imperfect because of things you missed, even if they are only third-party software you use that has bugs in it. Additional problems can be that your customer does not follow the assumptions in your security case, such as, for example, putting a system directly on the internet when it was supposed to be behind a firewall. Thus, to be secure, you need to plan for defense in depth. Just like the castle shown in the picture, you need layers of defenses so that even if your attacker compromises one part of the system, it's hard for them to take over the entirety of the critical functions of the system. Finally, even if you are perfect at the time of release, the threat environment will change and you will find that you need to issue security patches to take care of emergent threats. Make sure you have a secure way to issue updates, keeping in mind that online updates are also a great way for an attacker to send Trojan horses your way. Thus, it's important to have a secure update and secure boot capability as part of your system. Wrapping up, we've spoken about all the elements of a good security plan. A security plan is a written document that says what you plan to do to make your product secure. It includes the following elements. Security requirements describe what security means to your product, both in terms of the security needs of the application and your security goals. A threat model describes who is likely to attack your system and what their likely motivation might be, acknowledging that unlikely threats are also possible. In the end, you'll have to pick which threats to spend limited security resources on. Vulnerabilities are the likely paths of attack to your system. These will include the types of ways an attacker can gain access, whether by a network or by physical access. Vulnerabilities will also cover the likely objectives of an attacker in terms of their attack strategy and what systems behaviors they may wish to elicit. Mitigation strategies describe the risk from various attacks, often in terms of probability and severity. It also describes which types of threats and vulnerabilities you plan to mitigate given limited time, budget, and resources. Finally, a validation strategy describes how you plan to make sure the mitigation really works. That typically includes both testing and ensuring that the software quality practices you planned were actually executed.